Did you know that Virginia is the birthplace of American whiskey? Well, they've been making it there since 1607, and Catoctin Creek has been honoring that tradition of small craft rye whiskey since 2009. Virginia grain, Virginia water, and Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is Sweet Mash Kentucky Straight Bourbon and Rye Whiskey, made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged, and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. I actually want to say, don't quote me on this by any means. I'm not the uh, 84. Well, you realize this is a podcast. I do where know. You're t- literally getting quoted okay. the entire time. <laughs> well, then don't uh, hold me to it, Fred. Does okay. that work? <laughs> <laughs> This is episode 306 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's episode, talking about the biggest liquor retailer you never knew about, here's your weekly bourbon news update. The European Union and the United States are now starting talks to address the U.S. steel tariffs that had a huge impact on the bourbon industry. The agreement so far is that the European Union will not double the tariffs on bourbon that was set to start on June 1st, but it will be delayed. This gives distillers a bit more breathing room, but the tariff is still in existence at 25% until the whole dispute is corrected. Distilleries in 36 states exported whiskey in 2020, with Kentucky ranking second behind Tennessee. And total American whiskey exports reported a similar downturn, declining 29% from 2018 to 2020 and no date was given if the suggested 50% tariff will be imposed once again. Father's Day is right around the corner, and Westward has a gift in mind already for you. Westward has unveiled a brand new whiskey gifting concierge tool that will ask you a few questions and will suggest one of the bottles in the Westward American Single Malt line. This portal will also allow you to pay directly and have it shipped to nearly 30 different states. Go to westwardwhiskey.com for more details. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Buffalo Trace has announced the annual release of Weller Foolproof and Craft Your Perfect Bourbon. Buffalo Trace fills its weeded bourbon barrels at 114 proof, hence the name Foolproof. This will have a suggested retail price of $50, while Craft Your Perfect Bourbon is aged for eight years, bottled at 95 proof, and also has a suggested retail price of $50. Both of these will have very limited quantities that will be released. Angel's Envy is releasing a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey finished in Madeira casks in celebration of Father's Day. This limited edition run is the third release in Angel's Envy's cellar collection. It's bottled 100 proof and will have 600 bottles available for 500 main members through a lottery. Public sale will have around 400 bottles at the distillery and limited quantities will be distributed to a few select states with a suggested price of $230. Castle & Key has announced the third installment of its Restoration Rye series. The Restoration Rye 2021 release features one batch with unique flavor profiles created from a blend of 80 barrels. During the blending process, the barrels were grouped in pods with specific sensory profiles, and the Restoration Rye 2021 batch number one is available for purchase at the distillery, as well as stores in Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, South Carolina, Texas, and Georgia, with a retail price of $40. Still Austin has released its first cask strength bourbon. This new expression contains the same mash bill as the flagship, but without utilizing their slow water reduction process, resulting in higher proof of 118. This is also reflected in the label because it's now featuring a black night sky to represent the stronger, darker whiskey. There's only a limited 1,100 cases that will be distributed throughout Texas, and it's now available at retailers in Texas for $65. This is the last update about what's happening with us over Bourbon Pursuit and our private barrel club. Two weeks ago, we selected four barrels. We had two barrels of Sagamore Rye, a custom barrel with our own oak bill from Broken Barrel Whiskey, and a Four Roses OESV that just seems to be the talk of the town right now. And we're back again this week, selecting eight more barrels. 
You can get all the details on how you can get access to these bottles and even join us on a barrel selection at bourbonpursuit.com and look for the Barrel Club link at the top. And for this episode, we talked to the biggest liquor retailer that you never knew existed, Kroger. Yes, that huge grocery store chain that has liquor stores adjacent to almost every single one of them. And when you add it up, it's hundreds of thousands of square feet of retail space spread over hundreds of different stores. And we're joined by Chris Blanford, who is the adult beverage field specialist for Kentucky, Southern Indiana, and Southern Illinois Kroger stores. We talk about the challenges of operating his 115 stores over distribution, competition, barrel picks, and of course, our favorite, allocation. Barrel Craft Spirits is always setting the bar for some of the best blends on the market, using stocks and barrels from around the world. And you can get your hands on some right now without leaving your house. Go to BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Uh, This week's Above the Char comes from Jordan, who writes me on FredMinnick.com. You see all these distilleries touting some gold or double gold award they receive from random spirits competitions. What does it mean? How many win gold and double gold? Is it pay for play? Do the spirits competitions benefit from handing out a bunch of high scores? Et cetera, et cetera. Very, very good question, Jordan. And full transparency, I own a spirits competition called the American Spirits Council of Tasters, otherwise known as the Ascots. I'm also a former judge at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition where I was a captain. So this is a an area that I have a lot of uh, knowledge and expertise. First of all, they are not pay-for-play. Pay-for-play is when you you pay someone to get the recognition. So if you pay a competition, you are basically paying an entry fee. It's just like, uh, you know, there's an entry fee for the Emmys. There's an entry fee uh, for the Webby Awards. There's an entry fee for just about every awards competition that's out there. Very few of them have like a jury from an industry that seeks out the the winners and finalists and so forth to talk about. The Academy Awards, uh, the Oscars, you know, that's one of them where there is a jury that's basically going out and seeking and voting on what is best picture and best actor and all that sort of thing. Spirits competitions are entry dependent. So if somebody enters, that does not mean they're going to get a a gold or a double gold. Now, that competition's judging criteria is very unique to that competition, and they are all different. I understand that there's a lot of them out there, and there's some there's some of them out there that I've that come up, and I'm like, I've never even heard of this one. I've been doing this for 15 years. So uh, so thing number one, they are not pay to play. There is an entry fee to enter them. But when they're, when everybody seems to get a medal, I can understand how people would say, well, if you pay, you're going to get a medal. I can understand how it can come off that way. But there are some competitions that are better than others. And the way we do it at the American Spirits Council of Tasters is that we are, we go by double platinum, platinum, and gold. The criteria on those, and I'm telling you, I just looked at the judging sheets from from our competition, and we have some very discerning judges, and only the top tier will get platinum and double platinum, and something like half won't even get an award or a trophy or a medal. Like so, it is a uh, it is a very discerning competition. Now that being said, these are business models, and these competitions do make money off of the entry fees, as do other types of competition. So this is a model that's out there in the awards circuit that if you are in a profession and you want to get an award or you want to get some recognition, you enter one of these and you hope you win something. But uh, I hope that answers your question. I will add one other thing, that these competitions, in my opinion, serve as the assayers used to do in the 1800s. It kind of gives it, if you see like one of the higher, when you see one of the higher awards on it, that's kind of like an assayer giving it a stamp of approval in the 1800s. And the government used to issue actual people who would go out and judge and give like a stamp of approval on whiskeys. We don't really have that anymore. It's not like with beef where you have 
uh, select and choice and prime, we, you know, we are kind of, uh, there's not really anyone like an independent body outside of these awards competitions that are grading these whiskeys to give you, the consumer, an idea of what they might taste like. And, and that's really why they exist. So I hope that helps answer your question. And uh, I appreciate it, Jordan. But if you have an idea for uh, Above the Char, make sure you hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. The whole gang here today talking about the, a different side of what we see in bourbon. And we know that we've had retailers on before. And it's always interesting because you always want to ask the question, where's the pappy? Where's your pappy? Or, you know, we'll talk about allocated products and people that are avid bourbon consumers, they, they don't understand every side of it. You know, we've got distribution, you've got the people that are selling it, you've got the market that might drive things. And then you've also got stores that you might even not realize that's the largest liquor chain in the entire state. And we'll, we'll get to that here in a minute, but it's, it's going to be kind of interesting as we go through here. We have to also give a nod to our host who brought us a gosh best guest ever yeah he mm-hmm. shows up with a weller full board i was like oh, gives us some weller uh, you come on every barrel week. pick <laughs> <laughs> look at this sure. and i know that we've had an opportunity uh chris and i are our guests today have actually shared the stage at bourbon and beyond uh year two years ago kind of talking about yeah. you know where whiskey's going and also their kind of stuff and you know, that's where our romance kind of sparked. So it's it's really good to see where this is going to go. Yeah, Chris. Surprised y'all didn't sit next to each other. <laughs> Am I in the way? <laughs> well, you know, I, if I've got dibs on Chris because I've been in meetings with him. I've done planning with him. <laughs> you know, we we helped secure like a huge sponsorship together for Kroger in the Bourbon and Beyond. So he's mine. There you go. All mine. right. Well, we'll I, I have nothing to offer you. Chris. Is, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, need, look at that. He's a, you're already giving him the dreamy eye. You need a yard. What about Kenny and I? It's, it's Jimmy. You need, <laughs> Jimmy, buddy. You need your yard spray. <laughs> Marty out on this love triangle. <laughs> I'll spray your yard. It's just me and Fred have been so close for so long. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm your side pieces. That's like it. A, That's okay. right. <laughs> It's turned into like Jerry Springer real quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you've heard his voice. So today on the show, we have Chris Blanford. He is the adult beverage field, fe- field, field specialist. Man, I'm already tripping my words. Spiel mm-hmm. Spiel specialist for Kroger in, is it just Kentucky? Is that what you I actually have uh, Kentucky, about 50 stores in Kentucky, Southern Illinois, and Southern Indiana. Great. So there you go. Got 117 about to get. A lot of A lot of territories and your role is mainly buying spirits for, is it Bever- like when you say beverage, including like white claws and beer and wine, beer, wine and spirits. If it has alcohol in it, we do start the show kind of asking some sort of random icebreaker. So here's yours, so people can kind of get to a little bit know more about you. So you're on a road trip. What's your fast food restaurant of choice? I bet Kenny or Fred could answer that for you, since y'all are you know in relationship. You know, actually, I'd <laughs> love are you to, jelly? I'd love I to am hear, jelly. I'd love to hear their guesses. <laughs> yeah, uh, my guess for you would be uh, White Castle. Mm, uh, I think White Castle is hard to actually find on a road trip. I'd say probably one that's probably more common, always good. I'm going to go with Wendy's. So it actually used to be, so White Castle's amazing, first off, by the way. It's a, <laughs> uh, but actually, Wendy's is correct. Aye. So for a long time, it was like, you know, McDonald's, but I guess like taste buds and everything started to change. And yes, if I was going to have a road trip, that would be exactly where I stopped. A little double cheeseburger, man. Mm-hmm. Just a frosty, frosty to go, frosty and fries. I love frosty. I see. I'm not a frosty and fried dipper. I I, I don't. I've never understood that. Sweet and salty, man. It's match made in heaven. You know, Wendy's is what keeps this body going. (laughs) (laughs) You don't get this. You don't get this by working out. (laughs) I tell you. (laughs) What about you, Ryan? You got a a place you you hit on the road trip? Man, it's probably lame, but I'm I'm a sucker for Chick Fil A or. Uh, canes. I love both of those. I'm a I'm a fried chicken junkie. I love that stuff. You know, canes is impressive to just like sell chick just oh. fried chicken tenders, and that's about it. And, and, and the yeah. sauce. I want I want a whole. <laughs> right. jug Their business the model sauce. is like, where's uh, Chick Fil A? We're going to open up right across the street and get the people who are in line. That is seriously their business. They're too model. busy. They'll come over to. Yeah. They'll come over to us. The overflow. <laughs> yeah. So here's what we do uh, when we have a road trip. Uh, we do it's a it's a family tradition. We make road sandwiches. And so Jacqueline will make really high end gourmet sandwiches and we'll like take a break and and eat them. So we have like our own little picnic for when we when we have long drives. 
but uh, haven't done a lot of those uh, in the last year. But uh, I, we in the house, we just call them road sandwiches. That's nice. Road sandwich. Road, road sandwiches. Yeah, I was about to say. It's like for me, I, I, I think I might be up there with Chick Fil A only because like you think it's healthy. And you're like, oh, I want to try to eat good on the road. And then you're like, well, I mean, it's also 700 calories and it's got the sauce. And like, like okay. you need to worry about calories. For God's sake. <laughs> I mean, he's like, he's like hey. yeah, look, it's as big as my arm. I, I, mean, try, I, I try. look at a milkshake and it goes straight to my hips, <laughs> you know? All right. So let's kind of dive in a little bit. So, so Chris, mm. I guess sort of guide us a little bit through. Let's let's just start eat something easy, like forecasting and starting to looking out like. So you're we all we all kind of know what our brands or bourbon brands that are selling and everything like that. How do you look at and start to manage? You said around 70 stores that you do manage and you try to figure out exactly like, okay, like how do we take care of inventory and what do we know what bourbon's selling in this state versus this area and so on and so forth? I'll tell you, uh, doing that 70 stores and that, you know, really have 50 in Kentucky, that's one of the hardest things to do by trying to make, you know, this store in say Louisville, Kentucky operate exactly like this store in Danville, Kentucky. And it's really, really hard to try to come at it at a cookie cutter approach. So a lot of it is, you know, data driven. You know, we look at what's selling in those markets, what's selling in those areas um, through our team up at in Cincinnati, you know, and that's a lot driven with the Kroger Plus cards, things like that. So really looking at the, you know, predictions and forecasting right now, these last, what, year has been impossible um, yeah just yeah. just guess is really like take what Not you did hard. last year add you know 20 30 percent and hopefully that was the right amount um so it's it is a very very difficult approach so the best thing to do is you know in those areas where you have the louisville and the lexington stores let's say for instance where you have so much in one area it's a little bit easier to navigate in those type of locations to where you're looking at um say like a country store say like a danville kentucky who's a very very small location around a couple of distilleries, but you're trying to pick the right items for them. And it's really just data driven more than anything. Now, new items, we, we always like to be first to market as much as possible, but sometimes that's difficult in our type of model by trying to run so many locations, trying to be the same, but also trying to be local in those areas that they're mm -hmm. in. Yeah, you actually brought up a, a pretty good point. I, I think we either talked about this or as I read it somewhere is that Kroger actually holds, I think, more data on people than Amazon or Google or anything like that yeah. because of the Kroger plus card of what you buy and, and they use that and they, and it, what you started collecting that data in like 95 or something. Yeah. Like, I want to say, I actually want to say, don't quote me on this by any means. I'm not the, uh, well, you 51. realize this is a podcast. I do you're know. You're literally getting quoted. Okay. The entire time. <laughs> well then don't uh, hold me to it. Fred. Does that work? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I would say that it's 8451. I want to say, I heard that they started collecting like the very first rewards card went out in like the late eighties. Once it was yeah, like they were one of the first ones to do that, like that, for sure. Um, to first start collecting all of that data. And I mean, I know exactly what you bought, Fred, yesterday. Probably. Not... <laughs> yeah, I read some book, uh, I think it was like Charles Duhigg Habit or something, and they were talking about how Kroger and like Target can predict when a child a child is going to be born based on, you know, the mother's shopping habits leading up to uh, leading up to birth or whatever. They can predict like the exact date, due date. Because of the data that you are, you I know, with your shopping that. habits. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. That. Listen, Target, Target is ha is its own like breathing animal. It's a, you know, I, I fear what they could predict if they really put their minds to it. Well, I mean, you're talking to a, a company right here that's been, that has a lot of that data. Um, and so it is impressive to, to see that and what you're able to do and, and how you're able to translate that into, of course, for us, selfishly bourbon, but on how you take care of that and allocate stuff to stores and all that sort of good stuff too. Absolutely. I think the the idea of around everything is also just trying to predict the future that we all try to do of trying mm -hmm. to, you know, because of such little space in those stores is just, you got to get to the next big thing um, and try to get it in there before it becomes a fad. And then, you know, we're stuck with a bunch of products. <laughs> yeah. And then what are some of the challenges like at the state level? Because you are running so many stores and so many, like you said, different locations, different demographics, different territories, and you're trying to get everybody product out. Talk about the challenge of distribution on your side. Sure. So um, distribution is is not the most difficult thing just because of the great uh, partnerships that we have with, you know, your Southerns and RNDCs and Heidelbergs. And oh, they like love that. you <laughs> now. <laughs> but that's not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is the, is the mixture of product. You know, when we actually go through and write our different sets a couple times a year, it's getting that stuff it's getting that stuff out. You know, the laws kind of hinder us of what we can get rid of. And in those areas, you know, 
we we are looked at as one banner um, all together. So one Kroger banner. So it's not just the Kroger in Middletown or Kroger in Danesville. So if say, you know, we're going to discontinue um, a bourbon or a spirit of any type, we have to say that we're going to take it out of all 70 locations. Um, that can be a that can be a little difficult when saying, you know, three or four of these stores kind of out in this area do really well with it, but it doesn't work in these stores. So that that is that's probably the biggest challenge is trying to do new items and get them out. I would imagine that's got to be hard for anybody that does get pulled from your stores because that's getting pulled from a lot of locations. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's definitely it can definitely be a big big change to, <laughs> to, depending on who you are. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of it, a lot of the stuff that we go through and we'll pull and really constantly wine comes out, con- you know, just the the palettes change so often. So, you know, we go through wine and trade out wine uh, really, really regularly. Vodka, Fred's favorite. Um, that actually goes, that comes out because of, you know, flavors and stuff. You know, the fad of, you know, yeah. whipped and it changes <laughs> into something else. So vodka changes really often too. <laughs> I think there was one thing that we also kind of downplayed a little bit at the very beginning of this is that you are also like the largest retailer that nobody even realizes. Yeah. Knowing that you do have 70 locations uh, that you that only you take care of. They're going, there's there's more Kroger's across the country that that even are beyond this. So kind of put that in perspective of of what we see. Yeah, or what, what kind people, of volume you move in? Well, I mean, <laughs> not to that degree, but like in perspective of what we would think is, as most people were like, oh, I'm going to go shopping at, you know, whatever liquor store, these are down the street or what we would consider a big box store. Sure. So I think that we're in a very, very um, unique position by being connected with Kroger, just our liquor stores being connected with Kroger. Um, we have this position of being a destination store and we have this position of being a convenience store. We have this, you can go in and get your quick, you know, Jim Beam white label and walk out, but you can also, um, you know, walk around and shop in our stores and we want to build that experience. I, I think that when you're going through and you're looking at every single store, you're trying to make an experience that works in that location. And I think that's that difficult part of trying to make those experience work for that customer um, and doing it across 70 locations. You know, as Kroger, we we like to be local in every single location. We're the largest uh, buyer of local product in Kentucky. So that includes, you know, when we're talking bourbon to, you know, hot just local and cheese and hot that. sauce and anybody that's a Kentucky proud product. So we want to, uh, when we're in those really country locations, we want to make sure that we're working with those country local people to make sure that it's as local as possible. Um, even though Kroger's very large and national, I think we have a little over 2,400 stores. You know, in Kentucky, we want you to be local, full blown local. So, uh, it's challenges of that of making sure every single. And I'll tell you, like I had uh, when we were promoting uh, Bourbon and Beyond, uh, we did. Uh, I did a a tour at their probably like six. I 10, think we did, yeah, six to ten, I'd say something like that of their stores across the state. And each one of them were very, very unique. Uh, my favorite one uh, was the one that had its own bar. Like you all had like a craft beer bar there. It was Euclid in uh, Lexington. Yes. Whoa. Yes. And, our craft beer. And it, and, it had, <laughs> and it had like its own it's culture. Old you know, they had, they had like groups that came in there and met. And it was like they knew the store manager. They knew everybody who worked there. And it was just like, I was like, this is, this is like cheers. You know, I mean, everybody knew everybody. It was really, really cool. And, and, and they then wondered you, who you were. Like, who's this guy? <laughs> like, who's him? this guy? <laughs> no, there was there was there was a line to there was a line there was a line there to meet me and get signed posters. Oh, damn! I, you try to br- I try to bring him down a peg, and he's like, oh, no, never mind. No. There was a the actually, line out the door. So I'm going to give him a little credit on this one. He actually made one girl cry. I don't know if you remember this. Um, on she purpose, walked or? up. She asked. Uh, so we were doing you know the whole thing for Bourbon and Beyond and the whole yeah. concert series, and the girl comes up. And Fred asks her and just says, so you're going to go to the concert? And she says, no, no, it's just a little too expensive. And out in Louisville, I'm not going to be able to make it. And he said, who, who would you want to see if you went? And she's like, oh, I'd love to see the Foo Fighters. So Fred just pulls out of his pocket there and just hands her two tickets to the Foo Fighters oh, wow. um, for that car. <laughs> yeah. And she just starts breaking down crying. And that's like, like that type of experience is yeah. wonderful for us. You know, she's going to go home and tell all of her friends that she got these great tickets at a Kroger tasting. Going and, Krogering for life. Yeah. And then... Fred made her cry. Yeah. In a good way. In time. a good way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I was like, I was like, oh shit. What did oh, I Fred, do? <laughs> tell? I was like, oh God, where's this going? Where's this but going? it was like those, that was like, I mean, you know, I, I cherished that. I cherished that because it was, 
that was like kind of that all that stuff was like new to me at the time and i just i loved i love that and all your stores are really great and then you have and then you have like my store my store where i shop and i got my own little hidden spot like i have bottles hidden in there for me uh the four square but i don't i don't think the demands on there like they are for a lot of other things but it's like it is interesting like you all have the mom and pop look or you have like we're as big as total wine look and what's what store is the more difficult one to manage what what style of a store is more and, and are they all disconnected or are some of them connected to this everyone is going to be different okay. so uh it is it's not by any type of law that we do it um it's just you know when we went in to put that store in what the space was available at the time gotcha. um ideally uh for cost reasons we love to be connected to the grocery store because we're hitting you on your way out um you know but sometimes in the area if it justifies for a really nice store or a nice location you try to find a bigger location build it up um, add everything to it, you know, for the full convenience factor. I would say the hardest store to manage it would be would be a store like Nicholasville, Kentucky, where you don't have a lot of play in the size. Um, you know, big stores are a little bit easier to manage. You can bring in a ton of product. You can always make stuff look good. You can just make it work. Um, when you're working with a store that's like you know 1,100 square feet, you're trying to make like this big, huge country feel of like a store like a, in Middletown, Kentucky, that's huge. And you're trying to make it look like that in this tiny, tiny little location. But then when those product changes come out, that's where the challenge comes is how do we, how do we keep that store with the new products and still try to get out of the same products at the same time? Talk about that challenge. Like what are the, what's the process that you have to go through? I, I know before we started recording, you sure. had mentioned that the way that the law works is that the, in the distribution model is that you technically can't have your own warehouse and, right. and say like, ship it all here. And then I'll worry about distribution because basically I'm Kroger. We do distribution very well, but the way the law works is you've got to say, okay, well, this many cases has to go this door, this has to go there, so on and so forth. So that's strictly based off of sales and what we'll look at. So, you know, take Jim Beams, for instance, of the world, uh, whatever that deal happens to be, what we'll do is I'll go through and whatever that deal level is, I'll go through and look at what the last say month's sales were. Um, maybe last period of this time, depending on the part of the year that I'm in. Then we'll go through and we'll predict it off of that last month's sales and then off of last year's sales. Um, ideally, it's just replenishing those stores and then building big, bold, beautiful displays. So things like, um, you know, hopefully you're walking into stores and you're seeing eye catching and popping displays every time you walk in. I heard a recent podcast that um, Fred actually said, you know, when you walk into some liquor stores where they're really beat up and run down and there's not these displays are kind of falling apart, you don't, you don't get that, you know, really warm feeling when you walk in. I want that opposite. I want to have displays, eye catching. I want everything to be fronted and pulled to the shelf and it looks clean and crisp all the same, all the time, no matter if you walk into a Louisville store or you walk into one of our small country locations. Yeah, you're trying to avoid the rat turd look. Correct. That's exactly <laughs> what we're trying turd. to avoid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are a few stores in town. You go in there, you see a little rat turd in the corner. You're like, yeah, I'm not buying here. Yeah, I'm going to go down the street. <laughs> yeah, but then, you know, that's where you find some of the rare stuff, you know, because they don't know what they have. Uh, I think all that's gone out the way. Yeah, it, it is pretty. But you do need to go to bad parts of town to get to for for that to even have a shot. But, uh, you know, I, I've always wanted to ask you this. We, I mean, we spent a lot of time together, but, you know, liquor is like a high value, like theft item. What's the most stolen thing out of your stores? Oh, interesting. So that's a good question. If you're going to just go typical like state, it's going to be cognac. So things like Hennessy, things like that. If you're just going to say just what's the most stolen in Kentucky, cognac, mm -hmm. Grey Goose, high end products. Um, it is going to be different depending on the area of town that you're going to be in for sure. but kind of all across the board it's always cognac and vodka ciroc uh those things just so bourbon's not a high theft item it really comparison. isn't no no i mean i think in depending on that store location you know if, if bourbon were kind of hidden in the corner or case stack in the corner we would see it walk out i think that that also depends on how we set up our stores too you know if you have some high-end stuff towards the back of the store and nobody can really see back there you know you're going down there and you're stuffing it in your jacket nobody can see and you walk right on out so i wouldn't say that bourbon definitely is a uh hot commodity um it's whatever that resale value is um and it's just people to turn quickly um and like uh you know i see on facebook or things all the time of somebody who's recently gone to some kind of liquor store and say look hey i've stocked back up look what's all for sale <laughs> so <laughs> one thing uh that people love about i guess more of the bigger chains or 
liquor stores is pricing like it's seems like you know the you, you're kind of loyal to your pricing and taking care of you know versus mom and pops they might have to raise prices because they don't have as much allocation of different items. Talk about how, about how you all approach pricing for your customers and your products. Absolutely. So I think pricing is uh, pricing is so important because that is what gets the customer in the door. What we're, what we stick in that ad, um, that's our first impression to a customer. You know, if I mark, you know, Woodford Reserve or Jim Beam at $50 a bottle, clearly you're not coming into my store to get some of the hottest, you know, one, two, three selling bourbons in the state. So I think that making those really, really high moving bourbons, um, really high moving anything at a great price to get the traffic driving in. That's how we do it. Um, it's not about, it's not about making all of that margin off. That's about getting the customer in the building first. Do you try to compete against like total wine and liquor barn? I look at everybody as competition. So I would say yes. Um, but I, you know, evergreen, I mean, even the small mom and pops, I think everybody is competition when it comes to it. So Anybody who puts out an ad, anybody who's got their stuff online, things like that, it's something that we always look at because we want to be competitive in pricing all the time. I don't want you to have, I want you to be going to Total um, or Liquor Barn if there was something that I could be competitively priced in for sure. But when, yes, we would look at everybody. When somebody like Total comes in, are y'all like, oh boy, oh shit, yeah. we, gotta, we gotta really look at our pricing. <laughs> hey, no, uh, like I said, competition's healthy. So yeah. um, I think it's very fair that everybody should come in and look and see what everybody's doing. Um, but you know, I don't want to be the only liquor store and I don't want to close any liquor store. So competition's full blown healthy in our environment. You know, you never hear like the mom and pops complaining about Kroger. Oh, uh, but um, yeah. So you'd actually, it's kind of interesting. Maybe they'll change after today. They, now that they know yeah. they're the biggest retailer in the yeah, state. Like, well, that was downer. <laughs> I know. I'm kidding. No wonder they got fireball displayed in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, never mind. Well, I mean, I was, ask. it's okay. I mean, I, I kind of want to ask a little bit more about the pricing discussion because mm -hmm. well, knowing in bourbon, and by the way, I don't think we actually gave you enough credit at the very beginning of this. Like you're a big bourbon guy yourself. Am, like you, yeah. you're, you love your bourbon. Mm -hmm. And, and big so fam. when it comes to allocated and limited releases and stuff that are, it's so hard to get kind of talk about your, your method, your system for pricing distribution, um, all that sort of good stuff. I've been prepared for this question. <laughs> yeah. It's the, one, it's the one that I thought he, that He we walks were... <laughs> in the door. What are we going to talk about? Allocations. Yep, allocations. <laughs> that's where it's going. <laughs> yeah. So allocations, you know, when it talks about just what the allocated product, in, in the whole grand scheme of things, it is up to the supplier and how much product is allocated to the distributor. And then that distributor allocates their product outside of that. Um, everything's based off of like families of sales. You know, Sazerac products, it's a based off the whole entire family, not just one item of, how much are you just selling a Buffalo Trace and you're just getting a bunch of this? Total fam, you know, Wheatley Vodka included, um, Fireball included. Do you ever feel <clears> pressured <throat> to like push those things a little harder? No, nah, no, I don't ever. I like to be fair with everybody, so I don't feel pressure. Now, could you say if sales reps and stuff like that could be feeling pressure at a uh, you know store level? Maybe, I, I'm not sure I don't work with those type, but I don't feel pressure to say, you need to buy this to get more of this. It's not the way that I operate. I want to buy the right things that sell in the store. Um, it's about space mm -hmm. and it's about product turning over. I mean, I could buy a ton of something, but if it doesn't move and the data doesn't show it, it doesn't make sense financially. It's us sitting on a lot of capital in those type of stores if the product isn't turning over. Um, everything you should see in our stores should be something that moves quick, especially something on the floor. should be something that moves relatively quick. You know, the best part is on allocations is we get our allocations, it comes to us, and then um, mostly that allocation is decided on where I want it to go. You know, I'll, I'll always start with the top big stores in the state, clearly, um, but then I like to keep it interesting. Just depends on how much we get. You know, if I get 50 cases of something, there's a good chance that every store that I have is going to get at least one case because I do like to keep, you know, these little tiny country stores out in Brandenburg, Kentucky, that you might see something that you would never expect to see just walking in a really tiny now little Kroger Stop store in there. the Brandenburg Kroger. Yeah, yeah. every pop Kroger in. you should pop into. That's where all the double eagle very rare go. <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah, that's all. It's all sitting back there. <laughs> <laughs> and then after after I ship everything to Fred's house, too. And start mm, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, yeah. listen, yeah. bro, we didn't talk about Oh, this. sorry. You didn't know when yeah. told me that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, allocations is a... um. It's the thing that I get the most questions about on a regular daily basis from I would everybody. So. You know, where is the pappy at? Where is this going to be at? 
best thing is just uh, I go by sales and then you know I'll look at events. If we're going to try to do some kind of neat and fun event that we want to drive up some business or drive some excitement into a store, we might hold a couple bottles back. Um, so Derby, for instance, is a great example of our Middletown location does 10 days of Derby. So we do a different bottle giveaway every single, not giveaway, but different bottle raffle every single day um, to just kind of keep it, keep it interesting, keep the customers coming in the door. And I guess that goes into a good segue of just Van Winkle in general. I mean, we all know that this is something that is just entirely swooped the nation. And most of us in the bourbon world are just like fed up with it. We're like, okay, we get it. But you have to deal with happy allocation, people asking where it's at. And what have you found is the, the most fair method of making this happen? Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53-gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. It's time to fling into spring at Total Wine and more, where fresh flavors are in full bloom and we're talking bubbly and brunch with Pinot on the porch. So no matter what's on your table, they have the wine and the savings to match. Bacon practically begs for Chardonnay. And which rosé are you feeling today? They surely have your shade. Brighten up your glass with a fresh bourbon cocktail. Mint julep or a Belmont jewel, anyone? And with over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers to choose from, you can expect the unexpected. And always at low prices with the best service in America. So what will it be today? Choose curbside pickup or in-store pickup. You can explore more in the store or online at TotalWine.com. Ever wonder how the secondary market is changing American whiskey? Over the last 10 years, the bourbon boom has produced a terrific and terrible dichotomy. More people than ever are enjoying America's native spirit with a rich culture of fans and festivals to celebrate it. Higher prices, black market sales, and the reality of enjoying bourbon in the 21st century, Heaven Hill Distillery dives into how illegal bourbon sales have thrived for years and their impact on legal market prices on their blog at blog.heavenhilldistillery.com. So for more educational resources and to sign up for their newsletter, please visit heavenhilldistillery.com. And Heaven Hill reminds you to think wisely, drink wisely. Cheers. You have to deal with happy allocation, people asking where it's at, and what have you found is the, the most fair method of making this happen? First off, happy time of the year is the worst time of the year. <laughs> it's the people who have never talked to me before somehow figure out a way to get a hold of me. Yeah. <laughs> they will just, they'll call random office lines in my office and like somehow they get to me and then I, I get one big sob story of why they should have fat. I'm like, I've, I've heard it and I would love to help you, but I can't. Um, I think the fairest method for me, uh, we started, you know, this year was much different because of COVID. Um, but in the past, I, the, what we've done is we've done a, what's called a Black Friday lottery. Um, four hours, every single store um, in mine. So I have the 50. So all 50 locations for four straight hours, you could go into any location and every location was guaranteed at least four bottles. Some have much more than that. Some have just four. Um, what I liked about it is that made it fair across the whole state. That's something I agree with you is the happy is just and when you're in the bourbon world, that's all you hear about. That's all you hear about. Um, but, you know, our customers want it and we should try to make that as fair as possible. Could I just send it all to one location and do some massive crazy? Sure, we could. But I like the fairness of giving that that guy who's never had it in Mount Washington might actually have a chance to get it. Um, I think that it's really neat of that surprise and delight of somebody that just gets this bottle and has no idea. No clue that they had a chance to get it. So I, I like to give it and open it to the public. Um, but I do it all in four hours. Mostly this year was a little different. We just did it for a full week to, you mm -hmm. know, limit visits inside of a store. Um, but four hours, it gets an excitement. Um, what we notice is that those uh, the families where people were driving around together, they kind of made it like an, an event, you know, on Black mm -hmm. Friday. You know, their wives are all out shopping. All these other people are just jumping in the car together and they kind of have maps of like, all right. 
this is how we get to these stores the quickest. We've routed out yeah. on Google Maps. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Let's get there. Um, which is, it's it's that excitement that brings it up. And, you know, people are talking about it on Twitter and talking about it and have just how much fun it was to just kind of stand in line and do that. And um, the best part about it for me is we put, usually pull the bottles the next day and every single bottle is gone in 24 to 48 hours and then i never have to worry about it again until 364 <laughs> yeah you have a little calendar yeah, so yeah when i count down when you deal with something for like a full-blown week or two it's just it's a it's a really long drawn out process i like to get it in and out um, but i do think that that makes it as fair as possible um for everybody you know kroger doesn't have that technology yet where we can do kind of what i've seen total and liquor barn do which i love is going straight online and getting those chances to enter and we're just we're away from that right now because of the complex business that we have um, being on top of it, being a grocery yeah. store and a liquor store. So a little bit of ways from that. Maybe one day we'll go to that. But I, I like the I like the way that we're doing it. At least do you do you um, do you think that if 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 Sazerac increased their pricing on on Pappy, we would see the end of these lotteries? And if, if it like actually was priced to what it's might be, you know, val- really valued at. I'll tell you, that's a really interesting question. And. You know, I think we were talking with some other bottles up there. I think that once price gets to a certain point, I think that, yeah, you could uh, see that that may not be as crazy as it used to be. But, you know, as well as I do, as you know, in the auctions and stuff like that, this stuff still goes for crazy amounts of money. Now, I know that that's for charity auctions and things like that, but I'd, I'd like to think that maybe it would if those prices went up. But I mean, you know, we recently just had a lottery where we sold the whole line of Bappy Van Winkle in a charity and it went for twenty six thousand dollars. So I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not sure how to answer that question. (laughs) There's a high ceiling there. You know, that's a charity. It's always a little different when you can get your money for charity. But uh, I'm not I'm it's a great question. I'm not sure. Well, I mean, the one thing that I, I've noticed over the years, Fred, is is when people do raise the prices, then the secondary market also just doubles the price. Yeah, I, mean, I think I yeah, think true. Willett Family Estate was the best example of that when people used to go and it was ten dollars a year. You know, you get a fourteen year for one hundred and forty dollars, and you go and you put it on the secondary market for three hundred, and then it was it was sold, and then then it, they changed it, and now it was like twenty to thirty, and you're paying like four or five hundred dollars a bottle. And people are like, okay, well now it's a thousand dollars. People are still <laughs> buying it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it like I don't really know what the good answer is there. There's but not I think, enough bottles out there. I mean, the, the 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 real story here is is bourbon is like uh, it's been the value liquor forever, and scotch in the '60s through the '90s basically came in as the high end, came in as the high end whiskey. And completely, you know, changed everyone's mind about like what pricing should be. And so now no one bats an eye at $2,000 scotch. No one, no one. They're like, oh, that's, 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 that's where it should be priced. Uh, but uh, now in, in bourbon, that bourbon has caught up. It like sped up. I mean, we're, we're in a, we're in a like kind of a, like a growth period. Like there's some growing pains and the pricing is still, you know, to be determined. <laughs> and, and and because of of past laws put in place, the distillers can't get together and talk about pricing, you know? Imagine the- that. We actually were talking before this recording, we were talking about how there are there are particular bottles that still sit on the shelves today that are priced at 300 and 350 and they're not moving because I don't know if the bourbon market is ready for that, but it potentially could be there, but those are just the bottles that are going to sell at Christmas time, Father's Day, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, you know, even me, when I go out and just purchase a bottle, there's still a threshold to me where I start to think, like, when you get to that number, you know, I kind of say, like, 150 is always where, once you kind of pass that threshold, you really have to start thinking, yeah. like, do I want it? It has to be, like, something to? so special. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And that I think that is something that you really think about, and that does deter me from purchasing. It used to be 75. And then- <laughs> <laughs> Mine used to be 20. Yeah, right. <laughs> We've all been there. Yeah, the old days. So, so speaking on the allocation thing, you, know, you all do also a lot of barrel picks. I mean, that is that is something that you take uh, do a ton of. I mean, we were actually talking before we started recording this. You were actually picking Four Roses and all this other kind of stuff earlier. So kind of talk about how with this many stores, how barrel allocation picks and how they happen and how you decide, you know, what makes it special or something like that, because you're in a little bit of a different world, because when we look at barrel picks that go for... I mean, not just go for, but just the things that turn people's heads, people are putting like, you know, glitter wax dip on them and, you know, they're putting crazy stickers and like, that's not Kroger brand. So kind of talk about 
a few different things. One, allocation of getting barrels and so forth. And then two, like what you do to try and so, really push these. I, I love it because I, I think I saw you talk about something about the stickers and stuff like that. It's getting out of hand. So we, you know, we don't really do any of the stickers or print anything like that. We'll just, you know, whatever that label is, we'll make that label work. It would um, be hilarious though if Kroger had, had stickers on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we do like to, uh, you know, name, um, Barrels, you know, recently, not too long ago, we did an Elijah Craig and uh, every single one of them actually came from Deetsville. So we bought, I think it was eight barrels and called them just a day at Deetsville, just uh, something a little bit mm. fun. Um, you know, if I can put age statements on, uh, age statements are clearly all uh, what people look for a lot. So, if uh, you know, you can put it to 12 year, eight year or something on that into the label. I think that that also helps uh, go through sales. When we were doing a lot of tastings inside stores, tasting is your next big thing of trying to move those bottles. Um, right now we're not with the COVID situations, but you know, we'll eventually get back there. Allocations are where they go. Um, depends on the brand and depends on who sells what. So they will allocate again. That's all based off a uh, percent of business and things like that throughout the year. Uh, every company works a little bit different on how many I can take at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year. Some companies make us pick them all at the beginning of the year. Just everything is just a little bit different depending on who you're working with. Um, then once we look at that, um, I do like a fun thing with the stores to also, you know, if you want to barrel select, you got to go through and you got to respond back to these emails, keeps my stores, making sure that they're checking emails regularly, which is wonderful. And then we go through and we'll just allocate all of those barrels out to wherever we think that the market is correct for them. I do like to send barrel selects into some areas where maybe they don't get them in the those parts of the cities very often. Maybe they're not saturated like they are in Louisville and Lexington sometimes where everybody kind of has their own barrel select. So we'd like to go and spin them all around them. But I mean, we get to choose a lot from Russell's to Woodford's to, you know, Knob Creeks and um, we get to choose the, choose a whole, whole lot of barrels. So that's the best part about How's the job. How's it feel to be the king of the single, <laughs> yeah. barrel, single barrel world? <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's just you have like one of all the, good the things that's part of the job. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so one of the fun parts of the job there's then there's a lot of that whole data and Excel files of the stuff Fred has always told me he hates the most whenever we talk. Uh, just so goes through gut. That real not data the numbers <laughs> sitting in front of a computer just looking at spreadsheets all day is probably not the funnest part of the job. I would imagine so. <laughs> but speaking of that, that fun part, you know. We've never had an opportunity to do it, but I've seen pictures of maybe yourself and other stores that when you actually have to do all your allocation at the very beginning of the year. Typically, when we try to do ours, we separate it out. You know, we'll do like one like every quarter or something like that. But some distillers are like, no, you just come and get your five, 10, 20, it all. whatever it is. And so when you're going through, you've got 20, 30, 40, 50 barrels to actually taste through, right? I mean, yeah. And so it uh, depends on, so it really depends on that distillery, um, you know. Uh, Elijah Craig is a great one. They they, they kind of split it up uh, first half of the year, second half of the year, so you can take eight or nine. But yes, uh, you do go through and you have to sample a whole <laughs> lot of them <laughs> to get your eight or ten barrels uh, all together, um, which is the very, very fun day of doing all that. But then it's that whole allocation part, which is wonderful. You know, you're sitting around, you forgot that you did it and forgot that you did this barrel select, you know, six months ago. Then all of a sudden you're really distributed right nothing. to you and be like, hey, uh, you got all these like 10 barrels kind of in the warehouse. Where do you want them all to go? And then they send you how many cases and the yields from each one. And then you're like, wow, that's a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have to sit down and figure out where each one goes. I'll look at what, you know, if it's four roses, recipes, age statements, what, what I think will sell in certain areas. Am I perfect in every way? Absolutely not. Have I made bad buys? Sure. You can go in and see some. Walk around some stores. You'll absolutely see those. <laughs> not, none of them had the Trifesta yeah. like, or none Perfect had Beyond the, logo on there. No, no, no. of those. We, we picked some fun barrels oh, together, yeah, my did, friend. Buddy. Yeah, we did. We uh, Fred and I had a good old time doing that. that was, uh, yeah. And we had a whole plan to do it again last yeah, year. Yeah, we're going to do it again. <laughs> you know, I, what we'll am get I, there again. Do you have a favorite of our, of our barrel picks that we did? So one of my absolute favorites, and I don't know if it was the experience and the taste of everything i really enjoyed peerless yeah. um i thought it was just it was so much fun us doing it there with caleb yeah we live streamed um, that didn't we, we did live stream that yeah, uh, first live stream then fred and i uh went to a taco joint right afterwards oh my <laughs> gosh i forgot about that <laughs> we uh had a had a little too much peerless and <laughs> had to go find a taco joint <laughs> 
That's a good time. It's the best time. You know, I, that was a wonderful time. And of course, we got to really hang on that. I really love the Catoctin Creek we did. Catoctin Creek was great. That was, I mean, I've had a lot of Catoctin Creek, but that was by far my favorite Catoctin Creek. And this is the only, this is the only time you're going to hear me do it, but I'm going to compliment Blanton's. The Blanton's barrel pick that we did. It's not the only time you'll hear me compliment it, but that barrel's pick was great. It was a, it was a great. I, great I get, I get messages all the time for people saying that's the best plans I've ever had. I was like, well, that's Chris and I. We made <laughs> did great, that made right after tacos. One over there, the tacos <laughs> really pairs well with tacos. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've had so much fun doing that, and yeah. you know, Fred and I actually knew each uh, met, you know, at my last stint. Um, kind of lost touch for about you know six, seven months, and. Out of nowhere, I'm in Bardstown, Kentucky. I'm going in and checking one of my stores. He's walking out. We just kind of touch base. We say hi. And next thing we know, we're doing Bourbon and Beyond. And we're doing this we're massive sponsorship shop. stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then we're in taco trucks. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, we've had so much fun together, I think, over the last couple of years working together. That's fantastic. Fun. I mean, it, this has been really cool because you, you've given a lot of aspect into the retail side. Um what is the probably the most difficult side that you see or one of the challenges that you face on a, I'm not going to say a daily basis because I'm sure every day is when you get an email that says you got these 10 barrels and you're like, oh, geez, like I just got done doing yeah. 10 barrels last week. Like, so like on a, maybe like a quarterly basis, like what is, what's that, that thing that always comes up that you're like, ah, oh, we got to deal with this. Again. I think the hardest thing for me is because, you know, if we're going to speak just bourbon is how how hard it is to keep it on the shelf now. I mean, it's the it's the hardest thing because so many things just go full blown allocation. And when you're when you're at a company my size where you have seventy stores and that allocation is one case per store per delivery, well, you know, one case in some cases just six bottles. So, yeah. well, there's six customers. All right. Well, now we don't get anything else until the next delivery. Um, it's really making sure that the aisles stay full. Um, and that that has become such a very hard thing to do with, mm -hmm. you know, your very old Bartons of the world and this stuff, like H and H, you know, stuff that you would have never thought five years ago that you're having problems keeping on the shelf. Um, you know, so that, that is the biggest struggle and it's just keeping up with that and making sure that the right stores get it. And sometimes you have to take those items out of the set, um, off of those next ones because they just don't come often enough. And I don't want to sit there with a whole, um, because to me that's, you know, it's lost retail space. Yeah. Um, you know, we got to stick something in there to get it to move. Speaking what, of, okay, go ahead. I was going to ask you, what, what is something that does not move and it surprises you? You know, the funny thing I was going to ask, what is the most surprising thing that does move? Oh, wow. <laughs> See that? Like right off the and, top. And yeah. should you announce brand names? <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I'm trying to look out for you. So you're not with a taco um, stand with Fred later. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Asking for a job. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, it's... um. Craft stuff, I think, is very impressive, um, but it is, it depends on the craft. Um, you know, there's some things that just kind of blow out the door, and there's some things that you kind of get in and you buy into that story, and you're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. This is going to move really, really well. You stick it we on the shelf, it. and you're like, oh, man, I can't sell a bottle of this. <laughs> it's like, it's not going. It's a high-priced bottle. Kind of goes like what we were talking about when... When a craft brand is trying to come out and put something out at that really high tier at seventy nine to hundred dollar price range, I really start when I'm looking at bringing a new item and I have to look and say, where does that compare? You know, to me being very convenience driven, how does that compare to the rest of the items in the store? And is that thing going to move? Because you know, like I said, I'm not like everybody else who has the ability to sit on these products for ever. You know, it's a lot of capital for us to be able to sit on that stuff's got to move. Everything that we want to purchase needs to move relatively right. quickly. Unfortunately, I'm just not that craft bourbon place. You know, I want to carry those craft items, but we do have to be specific on what type of stuff we bring in. Oh, for sure. But I will say it's a it's hit or miss on the craft. And then the other things are just, it's, um, other things don't sell, just not to say brand names, is when you go out to other states and you see how well some other whiskeys and things like that just rock out. And I say whiskey, uh, not bourbon, just whiskey. And you see how well it sells in other areas. And then it's almost as soon as you cross that state line into Kentucky, it's almost like it falls. Just, it's not the same. It's everyone else is number one, number two, number three. Here it's like eh, five, six, seven. And, um, you know, for a long time, that was stuff that we really used to pile our stores up with uh, because nationally it's huge. But here in Kentucky, it's a different market because of 
the bourbon drinker and uh, all of these local distilleries. So it's a, it is a different market when you try to compare us to any other state. Yeah. And that and makes sense. We, we talk about bourbon a lot because we are, we are bourbon people and stuff like that. But there is uh, another question I want to talk about just in the whiskey category too. We, I, I had actually recorded another podcast talking about, you know, scotch for the whiskey drinker. And he said, he was like, you know, I came to Kentucky uh, probably about two, three years ago. And honestly, Kentucky is probably the best place to go hunting for scotch because yeah. nobody's looking for it. Yeah. It's, it's available. Absolutely. Probably priced well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's been times that, you know, stuff that's pitched to us and it's, it's scotch that other people would love. I, as much as I'd love to stick it in, put it in stores, you know, high end McAllen's and things like that. I can't sit on it that long. That stuff is just, you know, as we talked pricing earlier, that's really expensive stuff. And yes, we are waiting for that, the right customer to get it. Um, but you're right. I mean, this is, this is absolutely the area to go. If you want some scotch, uh, you should absolutely tour Kentucky. You'll, we'll find some for sure. <laughs> what would Even you? In, in probably at Kroger's. <laughs> yeah. You can find some at some of my bigger Kroger's. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So as we kind of start taking this down here, you know, I, I think one of the last questions I want to, you know, pose to you is when you start looking at the landscape of how are you going to, you know, either continue this or grow it? Like, what is, are you just trying to like, just keep the engine running? I mean, I understand that you said that it's really hard to keep stuff. It's like, stop. don't grow this. I got enough. <laughs> <laughs> stop it now. <laughs> no. um, so growth for us, uh, you know, when we started, I think Kroger started really putting these uh, stores in. The industry wasn't the way that it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago when we kind of for, popped that first prospect store in. And, you know, it was really wine driven, very uh, fancy, high end type of wine is kind of what what we were going after. Um, so I think to keep growing and keep doing this, it's about continually to not just uh, not just stock your everyday items. It's that you have to find that next gym to make the customer keep coming back as we expand you know, hoping to open more locations as laws change in those counties and cities and states because of the really difficult laws that we have here. We have many stores still in Kentucky that don't have liquor stores because of those current laws that they are, they have in that county or city or state that doesn't allow us to stick a liquor store in those areas. So there are still, uh, you know, we're seeing those laws change pretty regularly now. I don't know. I know you follow a lot of that stuff, but it, it it's, uh, you know, we're starting to see a lot of counties and a lot of other cities around here change their law to go wet. Um, and, you know, as soon as we get that, that's the first thing I try to jump on is how quick can I get a liquor license and build a store there? You're, you're uh, like, tell the, book, tell the butcher shop, we got to cut it in half. Yeah. Put it in the liquor store. <laughs> we're going in quick. <laughs> Call the commercial real no. estate people. Um, we're, give me a lease. I mean, we're we're in just such a unique area with with all of the distilleries here and being able to part and be a, a great partner to those distilleries and bring them in and have such great fun well, events. I mean, well, and you got Kentucky's great. just so different from region to region. You know, it's like you got 10 different kind of. Kentucky's, you know, oh, in one state, it's you, like that is so true. By you know, far. It's like Northern Kentucky is so different from Louisville. Lexington is so different from Louisville. Bowling Green is so different from you know. It's like every area is more. like so different. So you got to cater to all those different you know sub personalities of what Kentucky is. Can't agree more, Chris. Will we ever see Kroger uh, do delivery or do uh, shipping? So you know we do that in other Great states question. right now. Um, I think that that is. A lot of that is a technology issue for us. We are working to do that. I mean, I don't want to give any type of It's a of big dates. shift to move. <laughs> it is. It's a, And because it's those laws that hinder us from not being able to sell in a store um, makes it very difficult for us to, you know, use companies uh, to, as third-party companies, um, because, you know, use a company like Instacart, for instance, you get one transaction to use. Well, I can't sell inside the store. So if you're wanting your steak for the night and you want, you know, your bottle of Jim Beam, you don't get two transactions. So I'm a, I'm a whole separate location. So that we are working on it. Um, I, I hope, I hope that it's going to happen this year. I really, really do. Um, but it is in the process. Other States we do Indiana that we do, um, all across the country we do. It's just the, the laws kind of hinder us. The technology here mm. hinders us in Kentucky. Um, Ellen, Indiana, if you live in Indiana, I can ship to you. Uh, shipping delivery the whole night sounds place. about right. There we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just got to go ten minutes across the road. We just got to go give Indiana more of our money. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I do hope to get there, Fred. Great. Absolutely. Well, Chris, thank you again for coming on the show today. It was a pleasure to talk about all this. And I guess if people want to know more about like where they can they find about like Kroger events and bourbon things that are happening, what's the best way that they can know about it? Best way for anything is to keep following uh, us. You know. 
Kroger.com, we will go through and we will post events. You know, but because we're so local, a lot of the things that we like to do is advertise inside stores. Um, you will see so much advertising inside of our stores. So just keep visiting our local locations. Um, we'll partner with our vendors and distillers and people like you all to just, uh, if we have big events or big things that are going to pop out, we will absolutely reach out and uh, you will definitely hear us. Yeah, And make sure you keep popping those stores because you told us before that every once in a while, you'll just send a case of something random somewhere and it you might got just it, show brother. up. You so, got it. <laughs> yep. Good business to be in right That's there. Right. <laughs> well, Chris, again, thank you for coming on. It was really good to, again, hear the retailer perspective. It it really is refreshing, I think, when you get to hear this side and it's not like, well, you know, I have to buy 48 cases of, you know, Skinny Girl Vodka to get one Pappy 23 and of course I'm going to sell it for $3,000, right? I mean, you want to hear a, a different side of this. Yeah. And so this was a, it is refreshing. I to, sold all the Skinny Girl Vodka, Fred. It's all. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, listen, well. listen, I lost so much weight drinking. <laughs> I'm the new poster child. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the burly bearded man. That's, that's on, on, the, on the face of it, just yeah. right there. It just makes you want to buy a bottle. I love it. Well, Chris, again, thank you so much. Make sure you follow Kroger and figure out exactly what's going on in your neck of the woods and in those different locations. Again, he takes care of Kentucky as well as, would you say, Southern Illinois and, and Illinois and Southern Indiana. There you go. And so make sure you check your, also your other local Kroger's across the nation too. Those full fuel points. There you go. That's right. Stack them up on the card. Make sure you follow us as well. Bourbon percent on all the socials and you just make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. Cheers, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. Vodka sucks. <laughs>